everybody, certainly around this program, has been talking about inequality for a long time and uh, many years now and what we can do about it. Uh, our next guest has a very long view perspective on that. Uh, Walter Scheidel is a professor of the humanities and a professor of classics and history, a fellow in human biology and director of graduate studies in classics, all I believe at Stanford University. And he is the author of a new book entitled The Great Leveler, Violence and the History of Inequality from the Stone Age to the 21st century. So first of all, Professor Scheidel, thanks for joining us. Well, thank you for having me. Well, I'm reading your book and it's fascinating. And you know, one of the things you say in it is you say uh, a lot has been written about inequality. Certainly it has in economics and the social sciences particularly. But you say less has been written about the forces that have caused inequality to fall across much of the world earlier in the 20th century and far less still about the distribution of material resources in the more distant past. So your book covers that. Um, but uh, one of the things I wanted to specifically talk to you about is this challenge of um, redressing inequality. And it's sort of implicit in your title, but I wanted to talk about it, your subtitle, I should say, about violence. But uh, you, you look at inequality over a period of, of many, many, many years, and uh, it's, uh, is it basically your conclusion that it takes a catastrophe of, catastrophe of some kind in order to uh, right the kind of inequality we're seeing now? Uh, that is at least what history would suggest. Of course, history doesn't predict the future, but it gives us a very good sense of what used to work in the past, what is difficult or easy to accomplish. And so what I found by looking at literally thousands of years of human history going back into antiquity is that there really has been a pattern. And the pattern has been that only very massive dislocations, violent shocks, have been capable of really substantially reducing inequality of income and wealth. And they used to come in four flavors. I refer to them as the four horsemen of violent leveling, an analogy to the four horsemen of the apocalypse and revelation. Uh, there are mass mobilization warfare, like World War I, World War II, transformative revolution, like what happened in Russia and China in the first half of the 20th century, state collapse, and very severe outbreaks of epidemic disease. And what all of these violent shocks have in common is that they wipe out the fortunes of the rich, often they result in redistribution to the poor, and the net result is that the gap between rich and poor narrows very substantially. And while there are peaceful mechanisms also of reducing inequality, they are either linked in some meaningful way to one of these four different shocks, or they're not nearly as um, efficient, as effective, I should say, as those four violent shocks. And w when we say, you know, there are more peaceful uh, approaches that are not nearly as effective, of course, we're talking about things like taxation or, uh, or perhaps some sort of wage controls and so on. You list them in the book. But um, the point being, I suppose, that we've reached a state of inequality, a level of inequality in our economy, where I think what you're saying is that those uh, purely peaceful approaches might only have a marginal effect on the kind of inequality we're seeing now. Is that, is that an accurate uh, statement? Uh, that's a very good summary of my argument. Um, peaceful means uh, policy measures can work in simply maintaining an existing level of inequality. So if you think of the Western European welfare states, they have very high tax rates, a very high level of redistribution. If they carry on doing this, they may be able to stabilize inequality more or less at the current level. But if you are already facing very high levels of inequality, as the US does today, it is very doubtful that anything that's really short of dramatic can really change this particular situation. So there's a real difference between maintaining and reducing a given level of inequality. And basically, when we talk about those things that might dramatically change inequality, Professor Scheidel, we're, and, and the floor again, we're talking about you know massive epidemic or a mass mobilized war, state collapse, or a revolution. All of them are violent. All of them come with a 
large human cost. Is that correct? That is absolutely correct. Yes, the, the, the fatality tallies would have been the hundreds of millions if you go back just a few hundred years. I mean, the biggest shocks in world history, the Black Death, the World Wars, the communist revolutions, they claimed enormous numbers of, li of lives. And it seems that the more violent these shocks were, the stronger their impact was on a distribution of income and wealth, which is obviously a very discouraging message. Yeah, I'll bet you're a big hit at parties when you talk about this. Um, <laughs> That's true. Yeah, um, and by the way, I, it, one of the things that struck me, uh, and I'm sure it struck you as well, is that early in your book, I, b I believe even in the introduction, you, you cite the statistic that many of us have cited that in 2015, the richest 62 persons on the planet owned as much private net wealth as the poorest 50% of all of humanity, new figures say that is now down to eight people. Um, so I don't think we're trending in the right direction or even stable on the problem of inequality, right? That is absolutely true. I was really stunned to see those new figures. I wish my book had come out a few months later so I could have forked it into the introduction. But it really shows the trajectory, not just the US, but the entire world is on. And that's certainly a, a rather troubling experience because it's really not just the US. Uh, inequality in China today is higher than it has ever been uh, in Russia, in India, uh, for instance. And those are some of the most populous countries in the world. So there's a real global trend, not universal, but very widespread spread towards high and ever higher inequality. You know, it's very important, and I think you're right. I agree with you. It's very disturbing. I mean, and one of the reasons we call this show the zero hour is because I think we're, you know, facing some crises, uh, climate crises, economic crises, and so on. Um, but uh, one of the things that uh, that you talk about is, is this necessity for chaos, does that mean, not necessity, I shouldn't say that, because you say yourself that history need not be prologue, right. but there is no model that we have currently for seeing this kind of inequality addressed in a peaceful way, is that right? Uh, that's true, because what people do is when they come up with policy recommendations or recipes, they invoke things that worked in the past, say a generation, two generations ago, much higher taxes mm -hmm. and so on. But what they often forget is that those policies were enacted in a very different context, in the context, say, of World War II or the Cold War. And if the overall environment changes, it may become much more difficult to come up to implement such more radical policy measures. And if that's what's needed to really force down inequality, say, in the U.S. today, then we really have a problem because it's not quite clear how it would ever get uh, to that point. You know, and one of the things that struck me about this conclusion of yours, and, uh, of course, you know, it... it uh, it has no bearing on, uh, on the conclusion, but it felt counterintuitive in the sense that um, I've always had, I think as many people have, the sense that great inequality has an instability built into it, that societies cannot maintain this level of inequality without some sort of force, a natural force, if you will, uh, causing a rebalancing. But basically in studying these uh, thousands of years of history, it sounds like you didn't find that to be the case at all. Uh, so that would be the inverse of my thesis, right? Mm -hmm. The argument is that inequality is brought down by violence. And the next question is, do high levels of inequality somehow lead to violent dislocations? Mm -hmm. And the short answer is, that doesn't seem to be a similarly pervasive pattern. So sometimes that's the case, and more often than not, it isn't. There are many, many instances in world history of societies that used to be very unequal for a very long period of time and nothing much happened. So that doesn't seem to be a very immediate relationship between high inequality and some kind of violent breakdown. So what would you define, and again, we're talking with Professor Walter Scheidel about his book, The Great Leveler. What would you characterize as a long period of time? Well, for instance, if you look at the 19th century, um, inequality uh, really rose in, in many Western countries throughout the 19th century with industrialization 
and that continued into the early 20th century. And that process was really only stopped by the shocks of the world wars and the communist revolution. So we are talking about several generations, really, of rising income inequality. And if you go back farther in time, you may have literally hundreds of years of increasing inequality in the case of large empires, the Roman Empire, uh, much of the, uh, the early modern period, and so on. Now, you could say that development generally has accelerated in the more recent past. Um, everything happens more rapidly uh, than it used to, so it may well be that those periods will become shorter. But again, um, inequality has now been rising for something like, well, ever since the 1970s, which is already a pretty substantial amount of time, mm -hmm. and there's really currently no end in sight. So we may mm -hmm. well be still in the early stages of one of these prolonged periods of relative stability, relative peace, and concurrently increasing inequality. Well, that's a depressing thought, but before we go on, um, I'm thinking since we're moving on into the 20th century historically now, the First World War ended in 1919 uh, in the United States, and yes, the Communist Revolution and so on, but uh, in the United States, uh, that inequality continued until the crash of 1929, and then, uh, then the Roosevelt era and so on began to uh, substantially address it. Would you say that that Depression era through Roosevelt did not fit the four horsemen? I mean, it seems to be relatively non pretty nonviolent. Uh, that I case. know that's a common question. Um, the U.S. wasn't as heavily affected by World War I than the European powers, so it didn't have a big effect on inequality. Um, the Great Depression did to some extent. Uh, what is striking, though, is that even though income inequality went down for a few years after 1929, it was already rebounding in the late 1930s even under the constraints of the New Deal, even though um, higher tax rates uh, had been put in place, there were stronger labor unions, all kinds of things. And even under those circumstances, inequality proved to be very resilient. Uh, generally, it seems to be the case that economic crises only tend to have a short-term mm -hmm. effect on inequality. If you think back to the, uh, the financial crisis in 2007, 2008, uh, the, the shared income share of the wealthiest 1%, went down, and within just three or four or five years, it returned to previous levels. Sure. So the effects of economic crisis seem to be relatively temporary and relatively modest. And it was really World War II that made a huge difference uh, in terms of American inequality. So um, do we need to be rooting for catastrophe here? I think that would probably be not the right policy uh, recommendation. Uh, we can take <laughs> some comfort, I think, from the fact that uh, none of the traditional four horsemen is likely to return anytime soon. If there is going to be another war, it's not going to be a mass mobilization war. It will be a high-tech war with very different economic and social consequences. There are currently no Bolsheviks running around trying to impose uh, a communist utopia. State collapse has become very unlikely in most parts of the globe, and we are much better equipped to deal with massive epidemic outbreaks. So in that sense, the future is relatively bright with respect to the four horsemen, but of course the flip side of this is that it's not very bright with regard to an alleviation of current levels of income and wealth inequality. Which is not a reason not to prescribe uh, policy changes to address it, I assume you would agree. Um, and, and I think you answered my last question, which is I noticed on your uh, website, Professor Scheidel, that uh, you're working on a monograph on uh, the death of the Roman Empire and the birth of the modern West. So I guess you don't see a parallel between the collapse of the Roman Empire and the current state of the uh, US or Western European world order, eh? No, there used to be a fairly substantial debate during the invasion of Afghanistan and Iraq about imperial overstretch, and people drew all kinds of parallels between the U.S. and America. But really, there isn't all that much substance to it. I mean, luckily for us, we have moved on quite a bit, and the parallels are more apparent than real. So currently, there doesn't seem to be any compelling reason to expect some kind of major collapse in the, in the immediate future. Okay, well, I am going to continue to push for policies that at least somewhat reduce this inequality, but that's my personal choice, and I 
I found the book fascinating. We, we, I'm sorry we don't have time to get into more of the things you cover in it, but the book is The Great Leveler, Violence in the History of Inequality from the Stone Age to the 21st Century. And our guest has been Walter Scheidel, Professor Scheidel. Thanks for coming on the program. Thank you very much.